In this episode of Team Superdad, I speak to Steve Lovell, a relationship coach, former punk band member, producer of records, uh, some famous bands, and also a dad, uh, a, a great guy. And uh, you will love this episode. Welcome to Team Superdad. Roll credits. Welcome to Team Super Dad. Real dads creating their best lives ever. More time, more money, more fun. You are not alone. You're on Team Super Dad. Yes, hello. Welcome to the Team Super Dad podcast. I'm Johnny Jensen, your host and the founder of Team Super Dad, the program and community for dads rebuilding after divorce, separation, or loss. It is great to have you here. In this episode, we do an interview. Yes, the Team Super Dad podcasts are a mix of interviews, uh, time with me, where I coach and input into what it is to be a, uh, a single dad, and. We're working on The Hangout as well. So The Hangout is where dads from the community can come into the Zoom meeting and we get to chit chat and are fully looking to share some of those episodes as a more fun and down to earth way to just hang out with Team Super Dad. But today, like I said, it's a, it's a great conversation with Steve Lovell. He's a top bloke. He's been through um, divorce of himself, some health matters himself most recently. He's got an awesome uh, second wife a fabulous family, stepchildren, and like I said, some great stories from hanging out with um, uh, Richard Branson, bands that will spring to mind. I can't even remember who they were now, but famous bands. Frankie Goes to Hollywood, thing, you know, things like that. So without further ado, let's get stuck into today's interview and I'll see you on the other side. By the way, if you are interested in being part of Team Super Dad, then come over to the Facebook group. That's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Team Super Dad. The Team Super Dad Rebuild program is kickstarting in, in, um, in October. That's October 2019 with the pilot. It will be running after that as well. So if you have any desire to find out how to really kickstart your life in the five-week re rebuild program, then uh, message me at uh, teamsuperdad.com or any of our social media channels. And I look forward to speaking to you about all of that. Enjoy. Good morning, Team Superdad guests. Welcome to the Team Superdad podcast. Uh, today we've got uh, a, a great friend of mine. And it's a real pleasure to be speaking to him on the Team Superdad podcast today. Uh, I will let him introduce himself fully, but I do know he has a, a varied life. He's got uh, a large family, some of his, some of, from his partner's former relationship, um, and, uh, and he's impacted the lives of, of, of many hundreds of people, um, even ones that I know, let alone the ones that I don't know. So without further ado, Steve Lovell, it is a real pleasure to have you here on the Team Super Dad podcast today. Mm, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Johnny, and great to see you. Yeah, you likewise, great. likewise. Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's blisteringly hot, even though it's so early in the morning outside and, uh, hay fever is rife in the UK. I've got the window shut so there's no noise. Oh <laughs> God. I suddenly have a meltdown, you know why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sitting quite cool actually here, but yesterday was just stonking, wasn't it? It was so bloody hot, but yeah. we complain about that, don't we? And we complain about the cold and we complain about the wet <laughs> and we complain about the dry so what so it is to be it. british yeah yeah exactly yeah We're, is that is that a, a, a de deflectionary or it's just a way to warm each other up? i don't know <laughs> well, well listen steve we we met when when did we meet it must have been 2007 so oh my goodness it was 12 or 13 years ago wasn't it yeah about 2007 and that was on the introduction leader program at landmark education as i recall that's right yeah we met on that one didn't we and you just come back from the first weekend in amsterdam i remember with some very interesting stories which we might not go into here johnny oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the premise of the or the the you know the the the, the, the course actually encourages you to get complete on your past so you get some very ripe stories from people who on the first weekend they unload all of the stuff that they perhaps had in their dodgy past so it, it makes very interesting 
distracting uh, listening. I'm supposed to be interviewing you, Steve. <laughs> but we've left, we can't just leave that hanging in the air, can we? It's like Come a... on, man. Come on, man. So, Come so... Yeah, so, so the introduction leader program, I mean, in fact, many, many facets of, of, of Landmarks courses, and I'd hope in, in a lot of other personal development courses, there's an element of, of getting complete with things from your past. Mm. And I was, I, I was clearing up a lot of stuff. I had I'd identified myself as a bit of a weasel. And, and uh, so we were in Amsterdam, and I had uh, previously on a, on, a, on a a lot younger reported a camera lost so that I could claim it on the insurance. So when I went to the police to, to clear this up, because it had been presumed that there must have been a record about this and other people had been involved, and it was, it was basically a big, big fib. And when I got to the police station thinking that they would say, oh, thanks very much, um, have a nice rest of the day, they they arrested me. <laughs> but me and it was late at night. You didn't come in, did you? No, I didn't expect it at all. And I'd been out for dinner with another friend of ours, Jonathan Drew. So we'd had a bottle of wine, or, or maybe two. I'd said goodbye to him and, and wandered into the police station. So it was late at night and there was no there was no one to, to sort of process this thing. So they kept me overnight. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Well, they didn't charge you, no? Uh, 200 euros. Oh, they did? I saw the, he's like called a, he wasn't called a concessionary, but he was like a, a oh, justice of the peace. Mm. So I just went into his office the next day and sat down and, and he kind of chuckled and, and, and said, and I, I, I wish I did know his exact words, but, uh, but it, obviously in his very Dutch accent, he's, uh, good morning, Mr. Jensen. <laughs> and um, we just went through it and he said, oh, yes, so uh, that's uh, 200 euros, please. And I was like, oh, paid the money. But the real kicker was that I'd missed my uh, squeezy jet flight back home. So it was, and as anyone knows, if you try and buy a, a, a budget airline flight last minute, it's, it's not budget. <laughs> so mm. it was about 200 euros. For, for the fly and for the, for the justice of the peace. Uh, and of course, everyone, uh, I disappeared off the face of the earth for, for about 18 hours as well, so. And was it worth it? Um, yeah, I, th I think in the realms of taking responsibility for things and considering the impact, um, yeah. Um, and also another, another good thing about it was just, just the, how, how we might presume things are gonna be way worse than they actually are. So, mm. Like how bad also, it is. how those things impact us, and we're not really present to how they can impact us. I've just got to let the dog out here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I just um, here you go, darling. I'm gonna do go. some filler music. I can. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so, coming back. No, no, it's I'm fine. Here with you. I'm here with you. I, uh, so uh, sorry about that. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. The uh, the. I don't know. I mean, it was kind of funny. Obviously, when when I came back and 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 the and the whole group obviously had had got to hear about what had happened. Yeah. Um, as a great example of someone getting completely. Well, it was a real contribution. Yeah. It yeah. Was a real contribution to people. My family thought I was absolutely mental, which didn't help. Uh, uh, yeah. But all in all, I, th I think if that's who we are in the world, and you take that kind of responsibility for things, you. you then there can only be good good things come from it, really. I th and I think it's a, a strength of character that you can take into into all relationships, into parenting of your kids, subjects at work. You know, I think there's a degree to which uh, I, I don't mean like goody two shoes kind of level of honesty, but just taking life as as real and 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 doing it as it should be done. And yeah, and the, and the experiences of it. I mean, I got I was in a, I was in a in a the first thing I was in, the cell I was in, was like an old cowboy and Indian type thing, like wooden bench bars, right? And then you could just see out into the rest of the police station. I guess this was probably a, a I could have been there a hundred or odd years as far as I know, but it was really uncomfortable. So the, so the policeman said, oh, do you want to go somewhere more comfortable? So I was like, well, I've got to be honest, yeah. So then this sort of paddy wagon turned up that was full of absolute bonkers smackheads and people that have been fighting and I have no idea what and I'm sat there with all these guys and they took us to a proper prison and you had to check in like Blues Brothers style where you put your stuff all your empty pockets put them in at the thing um, and then they went, we went to this room which was my cell and it was just this like metal bench thing in the middle of the room everything else was built into the wall 
like a and it had a TV that had like three, very comfortable to me. But TV go. with like three channels in in Dutch, um, and 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 I just slept on this sort of plastic spongy thing in the middle of this room, <laughs> and then in the morning I had a I had a shower in a prison. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that. So, so it was, yeah. And then, and then off to the justice. Should, 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 I, should I do one then? Should I do? Oh yeah, please do. Yeah, good. Let's let's have it. Let's okay, have it. I'll keep it brief. But um, I used to work for. I knew Richard Branson quite well because I. Well, firstly, I worked for him just in a shop, and I didn't really know him there. But I also produced records for Virgin Records, so I knew him in that capacity. And also, I was I was uh, in a guitarist in a band, and we were signed by him. In fact, the only other band he personally signed was the Sex Pistols. Wow. So he got to know us quite well. And then I was on the TV program with him, what have you. So we go went back quite a way. But when I worked in his shop, he has these uh, summer um, jaunts. So his uh, the Manor. Yeah. which is a big recording studio and he used to live there it's a beautiful property and uh he invites all the staff and what have you and he decided to blow up his trout lake uh, at one of the parties as a, a you know a, a bit of a bit, bit of fun and killed all these trout and i'm uh, i'm really committed to animal welfare and been a vegetarian pretty much all my life and uh i was disgusted by this behavior so i justified here I am actually justifying it now, but I, I started to rip him off uh, in the shop and I actually stole from him. I stole quite a bit of money and I used to, you know, barter in Liverpool with albums. And I, uh, yeah, basically I was a bit of a criminal there and uh, I got that complete with him. I got in touch with him and said, do you remember me? And this is what I've done. In fact, it, what made me quite nervous though, I, I first got in touch with his personal assistant and said, look, um i'll send you an email and if you don't think it's appropriate don't send it on to him but uh she got back in touch and said you're a very brave man and i thought oh my god what's he gonna do you know anyway he was very gracious and he said look no problem it's complete for me just um contribute to one of my charities and then we'll call it a done deal you know so that was that was one of mine i had many 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 actually i won't go into here but i had many incompletions that i didn't realize were in the way of my life until after i got them complete and then there was just this clear space you know there was just this yeah. uh, lightness of being that i hadn't experienced before yeah i totally get that and i, I think that's um something i learned um through landmark and, I, and obviously i've taken it on in, in else, elsewhere in my life is that those individual bits of you don't feel them as guilt but when you can start looking at those individual indis, in, in, in indiscretions and incompletions people you don't get on with before you know it you're carrying around a couple of hundred of these little things and how's what's what's that like on your personality or on your on your openness with other people or or, or when you when you when you go into a record shop how free and comfortable were you with yeah you know oh then you were a shop you, you had your own shop for a while i had my own shop there you go you see so yeah well let, let, let's start to uh sort of stretch out this this, this life story a little bit so so what the, the band where were, where were you living you just mentioned liverpool where, are you from liverpool yeah so no, i was brought up in the burbs really in the suburbs of, of liverpool in a, a very quiet uh, uh, town called mcgull but I spent a lot of time in Liverpool and then eventually moved into the centre of Liverpool. I, you know, Liverpool at the time, we, we're talking about 1977, when the whole punk thing took off. And Liverpool had lots and lots and lots and lots of bands. And what tends to happen is if an area, like, you know, it happened with Manchester, it happened with Sheffield, one band takes off and this, you know, say Echo and the Bunny Men started to do well. I don't know if anyone knows Echo and the Bunny Men, but they were quite a, you know, they, they, they sold quite a lot of records and they were a very hip band. And then the whole of the music industry descends on an area and starts signing all the, all the bands, you know. So you'd literally you'd be walking down the street, you'd meet somebody and you'd, you'd say, you know, how are you doing? You know, who are you signed to? Yeah. And they'd say, oh, RCA, who are you signed to? Virgin Records, you know, it's like that. 
it's literally like that. Pretty much everyone had a deal, you know. So in that environment, um, it was a great place to explore, a great, 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 um, great situation to explore and to be creative. And I started to work with lots of different people. And I ended up working with Holly Johnson, who was the lead singer from uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And we actually started Frankie Goes to Hollywood together. Cool. Um, but I wanted to be a record producer. And I wanted to move to London and do that. And uh, we were doing this very odd music. I mean, I don't know where our heads were. I've listened to it again recently. And thought, <laughs> what the hell is this? It was really bizarre. I mean, one of them, we did a TV show and, and I played honky-tonk piano in a white dinner suit and Holly was on a rocking horse doing this uh, song called Yankee Rose. Is this on like YouTube? Anyway? It's an acoustic guitar and a picture of Ronald Reagan movie uh, as, a, as a cowboy in the background. Can this, is this Have on YouTube? YouTube anyway? Can we find it? Can well, we find the video? Only, do you know what? It's recently become available because i wanted to see it again and it recently became available i think you can find it on youtube if you put in yankee rose holly johnson yankee rose <laughs> i yeah. want to see this uh anyway so we were going nowhere fast and then uh, i knew all the guys who ended up in frankie goes to hollywood i uh, i produced them they were called the egyptians they used to be called and i produced their demos for them and uh, holly wanted to go more pop and they were doing pop. And I just said, well, you know, why don't you hook up with these guys? And we did. And then Frankie was born from that, you know. And I moved to London and I started to, I literally had 20 quid in my pocket. And I started to uh, busk on the, on the tubes. In those days, you could busk. It, it was illegal. But they'd leave you alone mostly, you know. Sometimes you get kicked off the spot, but generally they'd leave you alone. Yeah. And uh, I was busking for about nine months, and then one day I'm busking in my favourite place, which is Bond Street Tube Station. And this guy comes, and I kind of semi-recognise him, and he chucks me some money and goes, oh, my God, it's Steve Lovell. And it was a guy called Julian Cope, who's in a band called The Teardrop Explodes, and they just split up. And he's a bit of a legend. He's a bit of a nutter and incredibly talented guy. And uh, he said, well, believe it or not, I've just come from a meeting upstairs with my manager. And we were, we were after you as a guitarist because no. I've always been a fan of your guitar. And I, hadn't, I didn't have a clue. What are the chances of that? He's right? upstairs talking about you like you're somewhere yeah. in the country yeah. or on this planet. Well, and you're downstairs there. busking. That's it. And they were literally, they were saying, you know, how do we find them? They have no idea how to find me. And there I was busking. And, and he said, oh, the management will be in touch. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that sort of thing before. Anyway, they did. And uh, he... Um, and and one second, are and, you like a believer in yeah, the sort of universe and synchronicity? And, yeah. Uh, and Yeah. Do you know what I'm a believer in? I'm a believer in, I get to say how my life goes, no matter what the circumstances are. That's it. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm playing music, I'm playing music. It doesn't matter where I'm playing music. As long as I'm playing music, something will happen. That's what I really have always stood by, you know. So I, I just, you know, whether it's just, just ridiculous optimism or not, I don't know. But I kind of believed it was just going to happen. It's just going to happen somehow, you know. I've and are these, and these, like, this, this music time, are these wild times? Are you... Drinking and boozing and doing other well, stuff, or, that, or, or are you quite a sort of level-headed guy? I, mean, I don't know what no, it, that, madness time or. I well, I think if you look at my record next to a lot of people, I'm I'm pretty sober, really, you know, and yeah. pretty controlled. But it was a very dysfunctional industry to be in. Excess was the norm, you know. Yeah. Uh, you didn't get to bed most nights, you know, until the early hours in the morning. And you generally, were, yeah, there was a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs, a lot of drink. And it fun. I mean, I, it's, it's always a question I, I'm curious about because, you know, I've, you know, recreational drugs and stuff and raving and, 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 and the sort of the generation I've grown up in, you know, that, those kind of subjects for me were, 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 were speaking personally, were always fun. There was there was never a degree of peer pressure or doing it out of some sort of hope yeah. to be happier or anything. Um, was, was it you know was is it was similar for you or did you was it was it fun for you or, or done out of necessity or to fit in or, or you know that kind of question? 
I was always the last man standing, to be honest. <laughs> okay. I was always the one, let, let's have one for the road. Or whatever. I was always that, you know. And um, I had a, a history in the family, you know, my uncles, you so I could dream my mum and dad did. And it was kind of just the norm. It was just yeah. normal for me to... And then I went into that world and, and, you know, there was no reason to say no at the time. You know, I yeah. was fit, I was young, I could handle it. And it was only later I realised when I moved out of London, which was about 20, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I realised the impact it had on me because my health wasn't great and um, my uh, mental condition wasn't. I, I was going to say mental health, physical health, all of it health mental health you know yeah. not great and i hadn't seen it while i was in it we don't do it it's just the water we swim in you know it's just you don't see it normal and until i got out of it yeah it's just normalized and I got so when you say got out of it there was a, a catalyst for leaving the industry or leaving london or what well so how it progressed was let me just carry on with the story yeah. a little bit just to give you some background so um, so I'm, I met this guy, you know, Julian Cope, and he invited me to play in this band. I became his musical ranger and, and guitarist. And then um, it didn't work out with a producer we got in. We, got, we went in to do a single. And this producer, it didn't work out with him for one reason or another. And I said to Julian, look, I can do this. Give me a job, you know. And he, he listened to some of my past work that I've done, just demos of people, not masters, but just demos. And he said okay, let's give it a go. And at the time, the record company just wanted to wipe their hands of it. Basically, they didn't know what to do with it. So there I am in Rack Studios, which is St. John's Wood, be beautiful studio, owned by um, uh, Mickey Most, uh, who did a lot of the hot chocolate and all of the sweets and bands like that. And I've got a 40-piece orchestra, and I have no idea what I'm doing at all. <laughs> I mean, the engineer turned around to me at one point and said, are the cellos loud enough, do you think? And I'm thinking, cellos, cellos, what do they look like? What are cellos? <laughs> <laughs> but it was That's me, nod confidently. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think they're fine. <laughs> um, but what, what, you know, what was great about that was that it was a sharp learning curve. And I learned really, really quickly. I had to, you know, otherwise I'd be finished, you know. So uh, I went on and then, you know, produced quite a few bands and had some success, could have been more successful. But I did, you know, fairly well. And I did that for about 20 years. And then I started to think, this isn't the life I want, you know. Uh, I, I remember what I used to do. Is I go from a break from the studio, right? And I'd walk past all these windows and look in, and I'd see families, and they were watching TV and eating together. And I was thinking, that looks good. That looks good. I wonder if I could ever have that in my life, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking, well, with this lifestyle, I hope there's not a great deal of chance I'm going to, you know? My whole life was in the studios, rehearsal studios, and not much chance to, you know, be out there in the world meeting people and then um i was looking to get out looking to get out looking at, and i had a production company and i signed my wife was in a band a brighton based band and i signed her to my production company right and she had a ready-made family she had three kids uh split up from the relationship uh, we're jumping ahead here aren't we no no it's fine it's good we've we we, we yeah. do only have an, an hour or so anyway <laughs> 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 and we've got to think of our podcast listeners so um yeah so anyway, so from that point, I, I realized here's an opportunity to get out. And I literally just disappeared from the music business. I, I, I came, I thought, I'll earn a wage, I'll do anything, I'll paint, I'll decorate, I'll... I'll um, Reginald Perring, for I'll our, do, British, for yeah, our yeah. British sitcom fans, you did a Reginald Perring. Or, or... I did a Reginald Perring and I just, I just absolutely disappeared, you know. And then, um, and then I realized, oh my God, this is what I want. You know, this is it. This is it. Family is what I was looking for, for a long time in my life. And I've been in denial. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 the end of that. Really and what was that? So, so, and, um, it's, is Rachel, it's your wife, isn't it, Rachel? Yeah. 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 So, so she's in Brighton, you've moved down to Brighton and. Yeah. And, yeah. and what did she think she was getting a record producer and then and then you said no i don't want to do that anymore or she was well, funnily enough, in on the plan a really funny thing happened i'll tell you really quickly okay? yeah yeah we 
you know, when you get married, I was in London, she was in Brighton, she went along to the registry office and you've got to just do a, in fact, the council office and you've got to fill out a form and you've got to put spouse's um, um, uh, profession. And she put painting and decorator because at that point I was painting and decorating. Yeah. And I was there in London thinking, well, I'm still doing a bit of production. So I put record producer. And then we came along to meet together with the registrar. And, and the guy said, I was so embarrassed. He said, so what is it? Record producer or painter and decorator? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like this big. I was thinking, this That's is hilarious. Think I'm trying to big myself up, you know. So, um, yeah, so it was like that, really. But she, what she thought... she. She but no, hang on. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, what was it like falling in love? Um, do you know what? I'd fallen in love before, and it had been very passionate. And it then, you know, after a little while, dwindled. You know, as yeah. it does. Yeah. You can't keep that intensity going. And it wasn't like that with Rachel. It wasn't. It wasn't romance, really. She saw me interact with a little kid who came into the studio one time, and she thought, "That's what I want for my kids." Right. And what I saw her with a ready-made family and thought, that's what I want for my life. And that's how we got together. So it actually grew over time. So our love for each other now, it hasn't been diminished. It's stronger now than probably it's ever been. And I didn't know that was possible. I didn't know before this relationship that that was possible. And it is. You, I mean, so, so to some degree, you developed a friendship first? or, or you? Or... Yeah, well, it, it was. It was we were almost just propping each other up. She'd come out of a long-term relationship and um, I had as well, you know, a relationship that I thought was for life and it wasn't. Yeah. And so we were just literally, it was like we were just propping each other up and supporting each other. And I used to give her advice on, you know, her relationship and how, how she could complete it. And, yeah you know, the legalities of it and all of that and helped her with all of that and, and buying a house and moving out. And, and then she helped me with just getting my head together, you know. Because I, I, you know, I moved from being, I was, pretty, I was a bachelor for about a year in London. I moved from that lifestyle into a village, you know. Uh, it was just like mind-blowing. Well, like, no, man, but well, three kids. And three kids. Step you know, parent, instant step, step, instant step parent, yeah. Her. And what age were the kids then when you moved in? So Sid was five, Daisy was nine, and Fred was thirteen. So I've known them pretty much, you know, a great you yeah. know, part of their life, you know, because Fred's in his thirties now, and Daisy's thirty, and Sid's in his uh, late twenties. So. Yeah. Awesome, awesome kids. I've I've, I've met all three oh, of them. Yeah. a little bit yeah. more than the others. I mean, just yeah. wonderful people. And then I've got a a, a boy. Uh, so Rachel and I had uh, who's eighteen now, David. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, well, let's let's come on to that in a minute. What? Um, how did you propose to Rachel? Oh, it's a bit embarrassing, Johnny. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's good content. <laughs> I, rang her up, I rang her up and said, uh, we're going to get married. And uh, we're going to have a baby. That's how I did it. <laughs> just no class. I didn't ask. I didn't propose at all. I just... Okay. Did. That's the way I did things in those days. I was really super arrogant. Before I did that course, the Landmark Forum, which we were talking about before, yeah. I was super arrogant about things. I was just like, you know, this is what I want. This is what we're going to do. Yeah, you know, and it impacted all over my life. I used to drive at breakneck speed because I thought that was, you know, the laws were there for, you know, as advisory. You know, if you yeah. said 70 miles an hour, they're advising that, but it doesn't mean that. I was a bit like that in life. <clears throat> wow. So, she, I mean, just, just um, go, going off on, a, on a, off on a different tangent for a second there. Giving that up, I don't, it sounds like you couldn't have had the life you had today if you hadn't given up that arrogance. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was headed for disaster. I mean, you know, how can anybody get connected with somebody who's being like that? And uh, I'm, I completed a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I'd, I'd had some infidelity as well. I'd had an affair with her best friend, who was the... Yeah, and, and uh, you know, there were lots of things that they can complete. And when I got those completes, uh, I could actually go forward with my life. And I'm such a different person now, completely and utterly. You know? Wow. So what I can see there is you've got goals and ambitions. Yeah. And then you've got who you're being. Mm -hmm. 
at that time not really congruent with those goals and ambitions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They were past goals and ambitions. Yeah. Or past ways of behaviour. But, but I mean, you, you saw the family in the in the window. You saw getting mm. out of London. You've you've met someone. You feel you could, you could create that with. Yeah. But there was a, there was like another piece to that which which came along and 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 allowed you to be the person that's that well that's that was got all your goals and ambitions. Absolutely. I mean, it came at exactly the right time because we were heading for the rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so, I mean, this, this, this didn't mean to be a conversation about a landmark forum, but it is inspiring when, when, when it comes up like this in, in real conversation. So did someone invite you to do it or did you just... Yeah, there was a local guy who uh, we used to laugh about it because every time he, he, was just, he was one of the dads at school. We'd go on the school run and I'd come back and, and Rachel would say, have you been Anton? And what she meant... <laughs> oh, Anton Pruden. Anton Fudor. Yeah, yeah, I know. The negative yeah. person I've ever met in my life. You, you want these people who say, how are you doing? And then it's like, that's the wrong question to have asked, you know, because <laughs> it was just gloom and doom. He was like, you know, he used to just pull all positivity out of you, you know. And, uh, and then one day I met him and he was the most he was incredibly positive. And he was talking about this thing called the Landmark Forum. And he kept on inviting me to these introductions. But I remember going back to Rachel and saying, oh, He's been brainwashed, you know. He must have been brainwashed because how they, you know. That's not him. How, it's not him. It's not <laughs> Anton, bring back the old negative Anton, please. But I saw how he transformed his life, and it was sensational, actually, really sensational. And I thought, I don't know what made me think I needed to do it. It wasn't even I need to do it. It was almost like I was just being led there by the hand, you know. Yeah. There's been moments in my life, you know, with record producing or whatever, where I feel I've been led somewhere and I just knew I've got to do it. I've just got to do it, you know. And then it's a three and a half day course and I came out um, just a different person, a different view on life. Yeah. Things smelt different, things looked different, things, you know, that I'd been hanging on to for dear life. I realised I didn't need to hang on to my views, my opinions. It, it just totally transformed my life. Yeah, it's hard to describe, isn't it? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I've got a similar experience myself, and a whole bunch of people I know from a new area of life, uh, something called the SFM, it's an online yeah. digital marketing and training community, and a whole bunch of people I know from then just did. One person did the landmark forum a couple of months ago, and now a whole lot of other people go down, and, and that sort of emotion has just swept through a, through a, through another group of people in, in my life, which is. It's remarkable when you see, and I, I mentioned before at the beginning, there's other personal development things that, that happen, and I, and I encourage anybody to, to seek that yeah. breakthrough in their life wherever they, they, they see it's, it's possible, but that's just one, one way that we know it's possible. Well, the great thing about the Landmark Forum is it is three and a half days, and you can't imagine, can you, that three and a half days could transform your life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous to say that, isn't it? You know, people think you're crazy, but it actually does. And, you know, there's nothing particularly original, I don't think, about the material that you use. You can find it everywhere, and particularly with yeah. the internet. But it's the context. The context is being in that room with a lot of different people who, are, who you find out are like-minded, you know. And the way that they share their lives has an impact on your life. Yeah. Something about it that's just magic. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, yeah. exactly. So you did that. You've 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 made yeah. the worst proposal ever, and it worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're now living in the uh, in a sleepy village in in East Sussex. You've got three stepchildren. What I mean, I, this happened to me. You know, when 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 um, when I proposed to my sadly now former wife, when when I proposed, I suddenly had a six year old. What what you know? What was your well, experience of being a step parent, and, and how did you acclimatize? Yeah, well, firstly, the kids had had uh, their dad was uh, in in a quite a famous band, okay? right? Yeah. yeah, and he was on tour a lot, and they their experience of him was that you know it was great to have him when he was there, but he wasn't there a lot, and so when I stepped into their life, and I was this consistent person, I was available to them they connected really quickly. So I didn't have any of the teething problems that people often talk about, about yeah. being a stepdad. We just got on really well, you know. And uh, of course there were times, you know, there were moments. But you know, one thing about doing the Lama form, I thought um, I'm gonna be their mate. 
I'm not going to be their dad. I'm going to be their mate, you know. We're going to have a good life together, but I'm just going to be a friend, really, and help them, give them a bit of advice. And I realised that I hadn't totally committed to them. And when I did the Lama form, I made this commitment. I'm your, I'm your dad, you know, I'm your stepdad. Yeah. And that, and that made a big difference as well. Um, and did you ever, I, I know the answer to this question, so, but, but for, for everybody else, did, you, did they call you dad or did you ever ask them to? Oh, they didn't call me dad and I never asked them to. But I, I, I was that. I was that for them. I yeah. think it speaks to them that I had. Did this. you create this? Did you create that with them? Did you? Did you? I mean, there was they were kind of teenage at years when you met them. So there was there was there was the space to do that. Did you create that relationship to with? To a degree, them? you know, it's one of those things that you think you're being very significant about it, and you say, you know, I I've not totally been your dad in the past. So I've got this back door open in my life. I close that door now, and I really, really want to be your dad. And they're just like, okay, yeah. All right, you know, they're, they're not really connected. You know, yeah. You're just there for them, you know, which is what they've needed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially yeah. with kids, actions speak louder than words. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's very good. Um, but, it, but it's not easy being a step parent. I, I mean, that, that there's. No, it, it isn't. It's, and it's also very unspoken. It's not, you don't get a bunch yeah. of step parents getting together going, Oh, it's a bloody nightmare, isn't it? I know it's a tough job, yeah. tough job. I mean, it's so rewarding, of course, particularly yeah. if, if a parent such as my experience is, is absent and, you, and you're taking on that role. Yeah. But, um, well, it's pretty mind blowing having three kids, you know, going from, as I say, pretty much a bachelor lifestyle. Even when I was with the partner, I was living a rock and roll lifestyle, you yeah. know, and, and then coming to um, a yeah, completely different setup and having that responsibility suddenly to three kids it's just like, and then we had david which followed quite shortly um, yeah Rach got so, um, so yeah. um just, just before we to anyone who's getting into a relationship with a step parent what would you say to them as well as what i'd say a couple is, of guiding you know, tips yeah so what what i'd say is have a look at your commitment to it right have a look at what you're willing to give because context is everything, you know, and if you can create this context, so the context I created was we're going to have a fun, joyful, fulfilling relationship, you know, and inside of that, you can, you can base the whole of your life, you know, you can see where it's not working, you can see where it's working. So I think it's really getting your commitment. What are you really committed to? Because don't get involved. You see, with kids, you can't just, you can't just, um, back away from it you know you can't just get involved and then go no i'm out of here oh, yeah. it doesn't you know for kids that's a huge deal so make sure that you you know you know what your commitment is firstly and then i think you know the kids never had a sense of being dominated i'm not one of these parents who say because i told you so yeah so what i did was i always explained to the kids um why i was doing something and I, I, I also a little bit like a dog with a bone. I, I wouldn't let anything lie. You know, if there was an angry voice, get it sorted and get it sorted now. I think that's really important. So yeah. things weren't brushed under the carpet and came out later. So I just sit them down and just talk and talk and talk and talk. You know, and probably to the point where they were just like, oh, shut up for God's sake. But <laughs> but it worked. It worked because then they felt it was partnership rather than me, you know, being the wise adults who knew it all. It was very much partnership. Yeah. And I think that is incredibly important to create that sort of relationship. I mean, I I, I don't generally share this that often because people think well, for a start, they think you're sort of bragging about it and they also might think that it's a little bit weird. But I have never, ever argued with my, my boy David, and he's 18 now. Never, ever, not once have we ever had a disagreement. Wow. And the reason for that is that he doesn't experience being dominated. Yeah. And I don't have the experience of having to dominate. Hello! Hiya! How you doing? This is how you doing. This is how you doing. <laughs> okay. It's in the picnic bag downstairs. We took it to the picnic yesterday. It's in the kitchen. See you later. Who was that? That's Rosie. That's Rosie, of course it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like that, really. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the main thing I'd like to communicate is you're going to get it wrong. Yeah. Don't worry. You're going to screw up. 
Yeah. Don't worry. It's okay. As long as you're giving love to them, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so back to David, what, you know, what, when, when Rachel told you she was pregnant, what, where? Uh, what? Oh, I was super, I was super delighted. I was super delighted. How, we were old, actually, were how old were you? Um, oh God, hold on. So 18, I'm 64 now. So it was 18 years ago. Can you work that one out? You're, you're, uh, you're 46. <laughs> there you go. I was 46 and I'd had, I thought my time's over. I didn't think I'd ever have a kid. And Rachel had had, you know, three kids. She actually lost one of them. So she'd had four kids. And um, she did it for me. You know, she did it for me. And, and obviously, very, you know, she's very glad she did it. it was, yeah, yeah. Of course, too, but she did it for me. And uh, it, it was, it was mind blowing. It was just a fantastic experience. Yeah. Were you at the birth? I was at the birth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, she'd she'd um, she'd done it quite a few times before, so she was very much like relaxed about the whole process. <laughs> Just I, I, Monty Python, pick that up for us, will you? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It was a bit like that. Well, I, I remember the the morning of uh, you know when she realised she was in labour. I was getting ready for work, you know, and she said, "I don't think you're going to go to work today, uh, darling." And I went, "Why?" She said, "Well." contractions i think we're gonna have it i said i've got a time to make a sandwich because i thought <laughs> i'm gonna be there all day <laughs> uh, but it was it was pretty you know it was almost like she was holding my hand to be honest with you she yeah and what's you know short short cutting 18 years but what's your relationship like with david i mean obviously i know him i've, I've well, seen him for nearly 10 years and then saw him um about eight months ago <laughs> Yeah. yeah, being a, a a group leader at an event, talking yeah. to adults, basically, you know, he's got his own band and stuff. You know, what, what's your relationship like with David? And what just kind of amazing, like? just amazing, just really free, you know. But we're, we're best mates. We're best mates, and I'm as very much his dad as well. But we're best mates. Do you know the difference between you know the relationship we would have had with our parents? Well, I certainly, you know, being of my generation, was so radically different because. Our parents, you know, Dave and I, we don't dress dissimilarly. You know, the music we listen to is pretty much the same. I mean, I used to play my dad some music and he was just mind blown. He didn't know where it was coming from, you know. Because you were on a uh, rocking horse. <laughs> with rock yeah, well, yeah, yeah, well, I didn't, know, I didn't know where it was coming from either. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. I got you, yeah. The divide between the generations was fast wasn't it yeah yeah you know the way we look the way we talk the politics the, the 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 culture everything was massive now it's much much narrower oh, so totally. i have an experience so i've been able to turn him on to lots and lots of music now he's turning me on to, to yeah music, you know so we've got this really it's phenomenal it's it's great you know we will go to a gig together we'll go and cinema together we'll hang out together it, it's just great you know it's like having a, a, a best mate really yeah yeah and i think you know that is uh, you know that's it's, it's inspiring for me it's it's the relationship i am working on with with my kids yeah um i think it's i think the reality for someone hearing that and thinking oh i wish i had that it's it's not something you can turn on no now no. and i say oh oh well oh, oh but we need to fix that we're gonna we're gonna make that happen today um you know yeah but look, look, look if you can get that all we do generally in life is dominate or avoid domination that's our general state of being as a human being yeah yeah so we're out there in the world and you know we're looking for agreement with our belief our belief system a belief system we haven't even created we've just inherited yeah we were born pretty much an empty vessel and then we build this construct which becomes us and then we try and protect it, all these beliefs. And so we're trying to dominate to protect it or avoid domination to protect it. And if you can get that, then you can just realize, oh, this is how I'm communicating to my kids. You know, I'm, I'm asking them to clear up their room because I don't think it's a good idea to have a scruffy room. Who cares? Who gives a bloody damn? You know, okay, they've got a bit of a scruffy room. Maybe it is good for them to tidy up again for personal hygiene, what have you. But you don't make it an issue. Don't make things an issue. Yeah. Don't try and thrust your ideas onto them. Give them freedom. 
to discover, yeah. you know. And I think if you start doing that, like from today, you know, start doing that and not relating to them as, I think, you know, we relate to them as kids, like they, you know, they, 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 they one day they're going to grow up instead of as human beings. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to treat them like this because they're a kid and that's how you should treat them. Exactly. It. But treat them as you would like to be treated. Yeah. But, so it's not like, you know, get this done, get your homework done, do this. But it's yeah. actually sitting down and, and talking to them. Why don't they want to do the, com the homework? Why don't they want to do this? Why don't they want to do that? And then just going, well, look, come on, it doesn't really work for you, does it, if you're being like that? That sort of dialogue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's very much how how I try and, and and work with my kids as well. Yeah. Um. And the you know, and it, it does create a habit. That communication is is ultimately a habit, or is a way of, between the Absolutely. two of you. And yeah. Perhaps if someone hasn't got that right now, a bit like you did with your stepchildren, it's right. Okay. Well, starting from today, we're gonna we're gonna begin to create it, Absolutely. and and that can grow over time. Whether the kid's four months or fourteen, you can, you can still time to grow that. Yeah, and also, you know, just realising how much of our life is lived in, you know, it should be this way. And then we have this guilt thing going on, particularly if your uh, father is separated, you know, from the marriage. There's, there's a big guilt trip going on. And guilt is the most useless emotion on planet Earth. You know, guilt doesn't buy you anything, doesn't get you anything. You've just got to look at what can I be responsible for here and what can I bring to the relationship with the kids? And get the guilt out of the way. I mean, screw it, you know. Yeah. You, you've screwed up here and there. We all do. It's fine. It's pointless as jealousy, guilt. I mean, it's, isn't it? Oh, it's toxic. It's a toxic emotion that serves toxic, you nothing. We? we love to indulge in it. You know? Yeah. Oh, I feel so terrible about it. It's like, well, okay, what are you going to do? Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, listen, cha changing gears slightly, as, as the old uh, as one of the cl podcasting cliche, um, money and health. Where, where, you know, you, yeah, you... Well, health. I'll, I'll start with health. Go I? for it, yeah. So I'm... Um, so two and a half years ago, I was rushed to hospital with... Uh, I, my, my bowels basically stopped working <laughs> completely and utterly. And I was in severe pain. And uh, I was uh, blue-lighted to the hospital. And they, they had to operate. And they realised that it was a tumour. Yeah. And basically, this tumour had been growing over a long period of time. And uh, it blocked my bowels completely, you know. So you can imagine uh, for quite a long period of time I was suffering from bowel. Yeah, really comfortable, that sounds, yeah. But, yeah, it wasn't great. <laughs> and then they discovered there was secondary, uh, it went to my lymph nodes and then started to spread. And it spread into my liver. So I had an operation on my bowels and an operation on my liver. And I had a, a, what's called a stoma, which is basically, it's a colostomy bag, yeah? Right. For a period of time. So the whole period was mind-blowing. I, I reckon, I was speaking to somebody recently, I reckon I've been to a doctor about five times ever in my life, even as a kid, you know. I'd never, I don't, somebody who doesn't take painkillers, I don't, I don't, you know, I've always had a healthy life. Other people get flu and colds, I don't generally. And here I was, suddenly I was sick, you know. So I've had that for two and a half years. Now I had a scan last week and the tumours was reduced by 90%. So I'm, I'm, I'm on a um, regime of um, chemotherapy at the moment. And that's working. It's working wow. really well. I avoided it for, for two years because I wanted to try alternatives because yeah. chemo has a real impact. But I realised that I couldn't go on like that anymore because it, was, it got really serious, you know. Well, what I take from that, just that simple statement is about, um, uh, the, uh, I've read lots about this as a growing movement around it, which is really about owning your health care. Definitely. I mean, I a gospel think, what someone tells I you. I got advised by my uh, um, Macmillan nurse to go on this, um, on this forum. And it's basically people who have either experienced ca cancer or they're, they're in their family. And I got off it within about, two minutes because it was all negative the yeah. whole thing was negative it was basically people complaining about their condition and being victims of their condition and, and i decided at that point i'm not going to become a patient i'm not going to i've got i don't wake up to cancer i wake up to a great life and there's something to deal with there's some there's something in my body that needs to be dealt with yeah but it's not going to consume every moment it's not i'm not going to be thinking about it every moment 
I get to say how I'm going to be around it. And how I'm yeah. going to be around it is I'm going to live life to the max, no matter what the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I've written a book in the time I've had cancer. I've made an album in the time I've had cancer. Um, next week, my wife and I are going to go on an adventure to Europe in our new camper van for, for three weeks. Um, you know, I'm doing, I'm involved in a lot of stuff still. No, that's awesome. But I think that's, that, that's made a difference. Who knows what makes a difference? We don't know. I, I think if you do research it, then that does make a difference. Uh, Les yeah. Brown, a, a, a speaker probably people have heard of, a, a, a degree of his YouTube, excuse me, yeah. a degree of his YouTube videos, he refers to his cancer and um, how it, it very similar. He's, he, he doesn't refer to it as his illness or he doesn't refer to it as, as this fighting thing. it. People like to say, yeah, fight. exactly. Yeah. He's just like, like it's, it's here and we're moving through it. It's on its way. You know, it's like, it's, yeah, this time shall come to pass type type thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's very much, very much how I've approached it. But that's how I approach life in general. You know, you can be a victim you know, of your circumstances. Or you can say, look, I get to say how it goes. I've got these dodgy circumstances, but I get to say how I'm going to be around those circumstances, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's really, as I say, you know, I haven't been consumed by it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not in my every waking thought, which I think it is for a lot of people. Well, I can see how the people around you are either wrapped into that sorrow and misery, we then create an atmosphere around you, a whole environment becomes negative, or people are inspired by who you're being and, and the future you're creating in, in like, I'm, I'm hanging around here, we've got stuff to do. Well, people rarely mention it to me, because yeah. how I'm being is, I'm just living life, you know. Yeah. So they don't, they don't even get involved in a conversation about that. Yeah, they'll, they'll mention it maybe in meeting, but uh, briefly, but that's it. You know? Well, yeah, I said, uh, <laughs> speaking personally, um, it's bloody great that you're that you're here and we're doing this. So that that's all positive for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have been a goner, very, yeah, very. Yeah. And and how does this this outlook relate to to finances? You know, you, you some might think well, that the industry was all glamorous, and you were you were you know there was a wash with the money or something, and then you're suddenly you're a painter and decorator with three kids, and um, you know what? Where in regards to and, and the relate the relevance of this, you know, obviously for people in families, finances can be yeah. tough. People who are separated, finances can get really tough when suddenly what you had becomes halved or or, or even less. Yeah. How have you managed? <clears throat> your yeah. financial journey and dealing with 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 money whether there was lots of it or not enough of it and and, and yeah. where's that brought you to today well you know how i used to be with money was really irresponsible as a record producer i mean you know people would pay you vast amounts of money in cash you know and i used to put it in the attic and then i related to it how much have i got have i got this much or this much it was a pile a I like can a pile, use, a pile you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. How much should I spend this weekend? Oh, I'll spend that much because I've got that much. I was like that, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, when you've got a family, obviously, you can't be like that. And you're right. I mean, I went from this, you know, you go, you, you go down on a Saturday morning to go out, and, and there's a check for you. You're pretty skint, and there's a check for twenty thousand pounds suddenly arrived, you know. And it's just like uh, that's how I live my life, you know. So yeah. it's all, all the famine or feast. And with the family, um, you know, I started to have to be responsible. But it was something quite romantic about just earning a wage and actually putting effort into it. But what my wife and I did, we learned to live simply. So, you know, my experience is that if you've got money, you buy a much better bottle of wine, say. But your actual experience of it isn't any different from a cheaper bottle of wine. It might taste different, but your actual yeah. experience isn't any different. So when you've got money, it doesn't mean that life suddenly is, you know, um, yeah, a, a rosier picture. You know, I mean, obviously you need a certain amount just to survive. But I've survived on so little and learned to. For us, going out for cappuccino used to be the big treat. Like we wouldn't even do that. We wouldn't even do that, you know, and certainly not buy a sandwich out or anything like that. So we learned to live like that. And there was a non-attachment to it. You know, we weren't attached to it. We were fine. Yeah. Still having a great life together. So when I started to earn a little bit more money, it was just, I was happy anyway. So I, I related to money as like, it wasn't going to alter who I'm being. 
I was either going to have it or I wasn't going to have it. And I've got a freedom around money. And I've actually found since I've had cancer that I've actually, I'm earning a huge amount more than I've earned in the past. I'm doing less work. But I've, I think also we undersell ourselves often. I don't know if you've had that experience, Johnny, where you kind of think, particularly I started a coaching company. You know, I coach relationships and I coach personal coaching. I do business coaching. I don't do actual business. I do how people are being around their business. Yeah. And um, that's really taken off in this past two and a half years while I've had cancer. Um, and I've, I've, I've really valued what I, um, my skills. And in the past, I hadn't done that. I've been, I can't charge that. You know, people, why would people pay that for me? And I've realized that actually I have got a voice and I've got something to say and I've got something valuable and people are willing to pay for it. Yeah. So I've actually, um, financially, I'm in a much, much better position now. I've got a real, yeah, forward thrust with it. Yes. Do you think that... that to your question? Or? Well, it does. I mean, it does. I think, I think people need to read between the lines and see for themselves how they're being around money and the difference what you just outlined about how, how you're being about money. Um, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a lack of focus or irresponsibility. Um, you know, I think... No. We're quite the opposite. Pe- people panic about money. Well, not and, so and when we panic about things, it doesn't, I mean, if we're trying to save our lives, that's probably an appropriate thing. But if we're panicking about something that ultimately it's not a panic situation, then we perhaps don't make the right decisions or, or, we, or, or we react in ways that aren't constructive. Very good, yeah. Yeah, that's it, really. It's, it's, um, but it's all to do with non attachment, really. You know, I, 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 I haven't got an attachment to money. I've got a freedom with money. I know that without it, I'll be fine. And with it, I'll be fine. It's great to have a little bit of freedom with it. It's great to have a little bit of money, but it doesn't buy me happiness. I'm happy anyway. Yeah. And it's not going to buy me happiness. So, and it's easy to say that. I'm not a single parent who's struggling. It's easy for me to say that, you know, because I've got this, this, this um, stability in my life. So I, I get for a lot of people, it's very, very difficult. But I think if you can be, um, if you can really look at it in your association with money, get a freedom around it, get, look, you know, okay, I've got no money now. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to be, you know, consumed by it. I'm just going to have a freedom around it. And then I think that generates something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so many things we could we could talk about. I've got some subjects about kids and advice you give them on different type subjects. But Ooh, can I promote my book? Oh, well, we would definitely get onto that. But do do that now because I, w- I want to finish with fun. So I'd love to hear about your book right now. Go for it. Yeah, definitely. Oh, do it now. Yeah, oh, yeah. So go I, for it. Yeah. I've just written this book and it, I've just realised I've got a not for resale copy here and it's all a bit scruffy. But uh, the relationship book you can buy this on Amazon. So it's Steve Lovell, The Relationship Book. And it's very cheap. I've kept it really cheap to make it available to people. So it's £3.90 for the... It's not cheap, Steve. It's remarkably affordable. Remarkably? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's me talking about yeah, relationship to money. And, and it's, it's remarkably good value. It's remarkably affordable. Yeah. And the e-book you can download for, I think, £2.90. So, um, and... and you know, it's something that I've, uh, yeah, I've been working on for quite a while in my relationship and also in the coaching I do. And I just wanted to give it, give, give away what I know. And is this a, people can use this in their marriage or in their business relationships? It's or more like a workbook, really. So what it is, is, uh, it, you know, there's an introduction to a chapter, a chapter about a different aspect of relationship. And then there's um, <clears throat> exercises to do. So it's very pragmatic. And then I go on to um, talk about it more in depth afterwards. But you don't need to read that bit. You just yeah. need to read the chapter and do the exercises. And within a day, I say, if you use these exercises within a day, things will shift in a relationship. If you've got some distance with your partner, something that you know your, your relationship doesn't quite light you up anymore, this will start to work. If, and this is, this is good for people it. whose relationship is kind of flourishing and they could take it to the next level as, as well as people whose relationship is on the, on its knees? Absolutely. Yeah. It's both about sustaining your relationship and rekindling your relationship. Yeah. 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 And I mean, 
the breakup breakup situation. Yeah. This will assist you in that as well. Oh, and what about if you have broken up and you and you're at loggerheads with that person? Is totally yeah, absolutely. It will assist you. I mean, that. that's that would be the biggest breakthrough for me. Is <laughs> you know clearly, it's not about a romantic relationship with my ex partner. Um, at the stage we're at, it's kind of gone beyond even being friends. And sadly, um, yeah. yeah. I do hold out that 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 hope to some degree, for, uh, simply for the benefit of the kids and every part, every time our life crisscrosses in the future. But but even right now, just to be able to resolve basic day to day, yeah, uh, commute football, well, it's tough. It's football it's boots tough. at five o'clock type communication. <laughs> I think the stance to always take is I get to say how this goes. I'm a hundred percent responsible. Yeah, not and not look at your partner for that. And then be prepared to give up your right to be right. Yeah. You know, and now I'm not talking about being a doormat here. I'm not talking about giving up your commitment to something, but <clears throat> be prepared to not always win the battles. Yeah. Yeah. I speak to a lot of, uh, <coughs> hang, hang on, one sec. Yes, Rosie. Yeah, okay, here we go. Rosie's. Making her own little vlogs here. Here we go. Let me get that in there for you. Oh, what are you going to take pictures of? Uh, she's making her own. Uh, making her own videos. Ah. Making her own vlogs. That's. I mean, yeah. Obviously, we're clearly interrupting the podcast here, but I, that, that's also real. That that's my life. That's yeah, my, I love it. My, that's love my it. important thing. <coughs> um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, we were talking about giving up the right to be right. Oh, single dads. <laughs> justifying their stance and tone and behavior towards their ex yeah based on what happened mm. and i and I, I, I try and encourage them to say well first of all what you think happened may not be her experience of what happened yeah, so, so how you're being back to her is based on what you think she did to you and actually if she didn't think she did it to you and you're being mean to her. She just experiences you being mean to her for no reason. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, it's what in Landmark we call the occurring world. So we generally don't get how something is occurring for the other person. We can yeah. get, get how we think it should occur for the other person. So we're always communicating into how we think it should occur rather than how it does occur. So if you can get, actually, even though you think they're totally insane, but it occurs like this, then there's, there's, there's access to real communication. Yeah. Which is basically what you just said. Yeah, totally. Know. Well, listen, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put links to <coughs> your book and everything in the show notes. And uh, well, are, you, are, you, are you, I know you're not a social media maven, but how can people get in touch with you anyway, Steve? Oh, well, you know, I've got uh, uh, an email. They can get in touch with me or they can go to my website. My website is stevelovellcoach.com. Um, and uh, should I give my email? Yes. Give me, so. Email me at, at um, stevelovellcoach at gmail.com. I'm going to uh, fix that for you so you become steve at stevelevelcoach.com. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring my digital marketing skills to, to you. Oh, good. But, yeah. Please. But stevelevelcoach, uh, L O V E L L coach.com, stevelevelcoach.com yes, at right. gmail.com. Yeah. 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 And so just to finish, Steve, fun. Fun, like, I mean, yeah, we could sit here and talk up for <laughs> hours about all the fun you've had in your whole life. But, but <laughs> right, right now, your, your social life, uh, one, one second. Yeah. Wait, wait, three minutes before you go to the show. Um, <laughs> so just, just, I'll come back to it. Yeah, well, fun for me. Where, 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 what's your source of fun? How do you keep your, you know, your, your friendships? Um, we, yeah, we spoke yeah. a lot about your relationship, but in terms of your friendship and your social life, where, what's your access to fun right now? And, and, and are well, you my having... wife says to me, every day has to be Christmas for you, doesn't it? And I'm like that. I am a bit like that. I'm a bit of a big kid, really, you know. Yeah. I love ice cream, you know. I love just the simple kind of, you know, enjoyment of food. I love food. I love, um, <clears throat> I love being creative. It's very important to me, being creative. So creating music and what have you. But I think it's, you know, it's very easy as you get older to just get um, weighed down by all of the significance, you know, the more 
gigs and all of that. And you've really got to just create it, you know, create that fun time. And I just enjoy, like I was saying, the simple pleasures in life so much, you know, get out there looking at the sky, you know, going for country walks, just, you know, being with the kids, those things that we kind of take for granted, really. I think that's, that's what's important to me, just uh, engaging with those. And uh, fun is very much with other people as well. You know, for me, it, it doesn't just work to do it on my own. Being with other people and generating it together. We've got 20 people coming out to the house tomorrow, landmark people. Um, I'm going to cook loads and loads of food and just, you know, going to go in the garden and the sun. And, you know, that's fun to me. Really yeah. Fun. yeah. If you're around, John, please uh, drop tomorrow, it. Tomorrow, that's Monday, isn't it? Or today? Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Monday. 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 Yeah. People that lunch on Mondays. <laughs> oh, you mean tomorrow? No, it's evening. No, it's evening. It's tomorrow evening. night. Okay, I got that. I got that. And and uh, I guess just finally, do you, laughter. Do you get do you get to laugh enough? Probably not as much as I could, but I do. I do. I'm I'm somebody. I I have to run past uh, what I'm going to say often to my wife because I'm. Somebody, I can say really inappropriate things and I can see fun in everything, you know. Yeah. So uh, I, I used to, uh, you know, get into a bit of trouble, but so I run it past my wife now. But uh, laughter to me, I'm, I, I'm not a big sort of comedian fan and that sort of, but I like just generating the ridiculous, you know. And I am kind of a little bit known for being a bit stupid, really, you know. A bit silly. Great. A bit fun. silly. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's great, isn't it? I, you know, I went to, um, just really, really quick, yeah, if we've got time. Yeah, of course we have, yeah. I went to see um, the Dalai Lama, um, 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 uh, Gilmore, the guitarist from Pink Floyd, had organised this. He's a Buddhist. Right. And it was up at the Ali Pali quite a few years ago. It's just a little festival, very intimate. And the Dalai Lama came. He spoke, and he spoke with all these different religious leaders. And they were all sort of, you know, talking about Christianity and being a Muslim. And they were very, very significant. And as they were speaking, the Dalai Lama was going like this. Yeah. <laughs> What's he doing? You know. And there was a little girl in the in in the crowd, and he was just waving to her, and he was just being so so free, yeah. you know, so in not significant, and having real fun. And then he came on the mic, and he was just making jokes. And I thought, oh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's what transformation is for me. You know, that's what liberation is when you can drop the significance and just get, you know, life's for living and just bite the, the what I'd say, bite the arse out of life. Bite the arse out of life. Love that's that. That's it. That's my leaving comment. Well, that's what, you know, I did, I did a whole bunch of these podcasts uh, to start with and they were all a bit serious. I didn't intend them to be serious, but what I wanted them to be was real. You know, yeah. and and it was speaking to people who I thought could help dads. You know, and 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 the context was all about uh, what do you do when this happens, and what can you help dads with that happens. And and I and I and I, I shelved it for a while and just went back to the drawing board. So it's for me to connect with, yeah, I'm listening to a podcast, and it's going to be about it's going to be for dads. Then what do we want to do? What we want to put it on for an hour whilst we're cooking in the kitchen, have a bit of a laugh, and 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 feel yeah. and be a little bit empathic maybe challenged by some ideas and ultimately have a couple of giggles and and that's a that's an hour well spent absolutely and you never know where inspiration comes from do you you can be very significant about yeah. it yeah, yeah. And, and, and inspiration can come from you know a very different angle than you think yeah yeah totally. so hopefully we've inspired a few people here uh, uh, maybe Steve, not uh, and I apologise if we haven't, but you know, thank no, you. No, 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 no doubt we have. And there's so many things we have we haven't touched on. Uh, even as I'm wrapping up here, I'm thinking about things uh, from our past and yeah, yeah. things you told me to do or not to do that I didn't listen to. And <laughs> <laughs> you naughty boy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but Steve, hold your book up again. Let's have a, let's have a quick one more look yeah, at that. Relationship book, Amazon. Amazon, you can buy it from. So. Yeah, and I've seen some of the, the testimonials for that already, so I'm actually going to get myself a copy and, 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 and oh, plow right. through that. It's a quick read anyway, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a fairly quick read, yeah. yeah. And, you know, you don't have to read it all to yeah. get results. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Steve Lovell, thank you so much for being on the Team Super Dad podcast. Um, good friend, even, you know, someone who's inspired my life. Um, 
like I said, it's not easy being a stepdad and, and knowing those three kids that have been part of your life. I, I know how, how touched and inspired they've been by you. David is a real credit. He's, he's as well as being a, a little you, he's, he's such a, a <laughs> character in himself. And I love how he's, he, you know, he, he doesn't worry about conventions. He's so much his own spirit. And I, and I think that's a testimony to any parent as well. Yeah. Um, and your relationship with Rachel, such a, such a, a, a yeah, we... strong couple and, and the people around you are so benefited by you being in their lives. So thank oh, you for being thank you, here. Johnny. That's a great acknowledgement. Thank you. Anna. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to receive that in the past, but I'm receiving it now. So thank you. Awesome. Cheers, thank buddy. you, Steve. I'm going to hit, I'll stop recording. We'll see you soon. See ya. Wow, that was awesome. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Steve Lovell. Plenty more interviews coming up with other dads just like Steve. Maybe some mums as well. You know, there's a, there's two sides to, to this for sure. Uh, if you are a dad or you know someone who you think would be an awesome guest to have on the Team Super Dad podcast, maybe there's someone you would like me to chat to, then send them my way. Put them in touch. Send them over to the Team Super Dad page on Facebook. That's facebook.com, Team Super Dad or Twitter, uh, Instagram, they both both Team Superdad HQ. And of course, you can email me at johnnyjensen at teamsuperdad.com. What's coming up next? Well, the rebuild program is, there's the kickoff, uh, the pilot in October. If you are interested in being part of that, then there's loads of benefits and bonuses for being on the, on the, uh, the first group. So get in touch with me now and speak to me about that. If this is, you're listening to this on like a box set, like if you're binging this, then you can be sure that the rebuild program will be kicking off uh, in just a couple of weeks, probably. They run every every two to three months. So you can be sure there's one coming up. And you can get inside the Team Super Dad HQ. That's the insider group with the regular coaching sessions and meetups and basically getting all the help and accountability and support you need from both myself, other coaches and the rest of the Super Dad community. Subscribe to this podcast. Please share it. If you're on YouTube or watching the video anywhere, then please also subscribe there and hit us up some likes. You can be sure they are all go towards promoting and helping the team super bad dad. <laughs> that is the problem of trying to speak too fast. That is the best way, liking and sharing and, and putting reviews in for this podcast, for this video, subscribing to the channel. That is the best way of helping me make the team super dad podcast and uh, and community as successful as possible so your support is welcome and appreciated much like your time today listening to this team super dad out i'll speak to you soon bye this has been team super dad find us at team superdad.com join the rebuild program and create the best life ever for you and your children you are not alone you're on Team Super Dad.